and welcome to this evening's live sex show. My name is Carly Woodward, I'm a marine biologist, and this is... I'm Caitlin Johnson, and I'm a behavioral ecologist, and you guys are a bunch of perverts. <laughs> so many of you here. It's really I know, all ready to see a live sex show. Uh, too bad it's about sea urchins. And here at the Exploratorium, we actually have many different organisms, upwards of 30, and many of them are model organisms, which are extremely important, important for scientists to use to study. For example, we have zebrafish embryos. We can see through their seashell or their shell, and that's extremely important. We have sea elegans, we have mice, and more importantly, which we're talking about today, we have purple sea urchins. And until you at least take them out to dinner, you can call them Strongyliocentrotus perforatus. Okay, maybe some flowers or something and then you can get a little more familiar. Uh, these guys are cool and different because they have what's called radial symmetry. Uh, so humans, a lot of bipeds, quadrupeds, we have what's called bilateral symmetry. You can draw a line pretty much right down our middle and we're more or less the same, excluding you know, pesky organs like the liver. Um, but these guys, if you slice them up into uh, just like slices of a pie, they'll be more or less the same uh, within each. So they develop a little bit differently from us. And you may recognize a similar kind of thing going on with their friend and cousin, the sea star. Uh, I know that you want to call it a starfish, but that's no longer politically correct. They are not a fish. They do not appreciate that. <laughs> sea star, please. Let's all, I mean, you know, we can all get behind that. Uh, so the uh, purple sea urchin, it lives from Alaska down to Baja. It's what you guys have probably seen in a lot of like the tide pools along the coast and stuff. Let's go to that guy, yeah, that's, guy, that's it right there. Um, we'll bop back a couple times. So this is some of the, the innards and the guts um, and what I was talking about with that radial symmetry. Uh, these guys are neat. They uh, crawl along on their mouths uh, and they live in kelp forests and their food is the kelp. So basically it's like crawling around on a bed of chocolate cake all day. It sounds pretty good to me. Uh, the part I would not enjoy is pooping out of the top of my head. But that's what these guys have going on. Their anus is right on the top. And they also have five gametophores. Um, so, you know, holes for doing stuff. Uh, <laughs> right on the top of their heads, which could, you know, make for some interesting cocktail parties. Um, more importantly, as far as that whole kelp forest ecosystem thing goes, I'm sure you guys know that's a really important part of our coastal ecosystem. Uh, and the good thing about these guys is that they provide a food source for things like the adorable sea otter. Aww. Uh, and, you know, we've had some problems with the population of sea otters along the coast, and when there's not enough otters, then there's a bunch of urchins. They eat all the kelp. They eat it right at the base and cause it to float away into the ocean, uh, and that can actually really mess with the ecosystem. So, you know, fingers crossed that the otters continue to return to the coast as they have been doing, because uh, that's what we really need for a healthy coastline. Yeah, in addition to that, uh, sea urchins are extremely important for the kelp forest ecology for more than just that reason. Um, they produce ammonia, which, sea, um, which kelp uses for fertilizer. So you may remember around 2011, there was a huge die-off of sea urchins, millions and millions of creatures, and they're just now coming back. Lots of juveniles are present, and currently at Bodega Marine Lab, um, there are studies going on to figure out what effect that might be having on on the entire ecosystem. Um, some additional research going on right now is at Stanford University, and they're studying what, how sea urchins will react to uh, rise in ocean acidity, so increasing CO2 in the oceans. Now, they've figured out that many of them can actually adapt better than we think by placing them in environments that mimic what the ocean will be like in 2100. Um, but here at the Exploratorium, we use them to study reproduction. So what we're looking at right now on this nice big screen is the uh, you know, piece de resistance of our evening. These are sea urchin eggs. I know that one question you have is how many times have they been magnified? And I can't really tell you that because I don't know the resolution of the screen versus the microscope. But what I will tell you is that they are the same size as human eggs. Uh, they're about 100 microns wide. Uh, and you might have heard about human eggs. Uh, Carly's going to pass some of these uh, egg samples around so you can actually see with your naked eye. And that'll give you a little bit better of a, an idea. 
Uh, you might have heard the little bit of trivia that a human egg is the size of a period on a piece of paper. Um, but no one's telling you, like, is that Helvetica or Times New Roman or what's happening? And also, it's kind of false. It's, it's pretty much just a dot uh, about the smallest dot you could still see with your naked eye. Uh, but the fact that they are the same size as human eggs and that the sperm are the same size as human sperm makes them kind of an interesting, I mean, it's cool for me, you know, to look and be like, hey, I make one of those a month. Sweet. Uh, and also just that when you are then going to go ahead and study embryology, uh, it's a lot easier to go ahead and bop out 10 million of these uh, than to find the equivalent of the human uh, gametes. So the uh, sea urchin, the female produces millions. It, it ranges widely, but somewhere in the millions of eggs every time she spawns. Uh, and they do what's called broadcast spawning, uh, which is basically code for an orgy. Uh, so they're hanging out in the, in the kelp forest, and one of them decides that they're in the mood. They release a bunch of eggs. Everybody else can sort of smell. Uh, they don't have what you would traditionally think of as a nose, but they have what's called chemoreceptors. So they can smell the fun times in the air, uh, and everybody releases in one big cloud. And the sperm and the eggs find each other in the open ocean. Uh, we do it in the lab, and other scientists, when they're studying the development of embryos, can fertilize tens of thousands of these at once. They develop simultaneously. You can then you know, introduce different experimental conditions and learn stuff about them. Uh, they also uh, develop uh, the, you can watch it all happen. You can watch the process of division happen. Uh, and, and it's a pretty interesting thing. And it's how we've learned a lot about how our life begins. Uh, and what we're going to see, uh, aside from the whole you know, uterus part, uh, will be more or less the same as what begins a human life as well. OK, here we go. We're going right. to inseminate. Drum Everybody roll. Ready? Drum roll, please. Wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah, wah. All right, so what you guys are looking for, they'll calm down in a second here. What you're looking for is for a bubble to form around the egg. And that bubble is what's called a vitelline membrane. And that's basically one of the ways that the egg prevents more than one sperm from entering the egg. Uh, basically, if you have too much genetic information, it's kind of worse than, than not enough. Uh, and that's, uh, it wouldn't be a viable embryo at that point. Um, so the sperm is swimming around. The egg has these receptors on the outside in her, in her jelly coat. Uh, there are some chemical signals uh, that say, hey, honey, I'm ready for a good time. Uh, and the sperm go to that. Uh, and the sperm, you can kind of think of it that they have like a Lego on their nose. Uh, and that's swimming around. And then the, uh, the egg has the other half. Oh, Whoa. there's a little dude. There's the Here sperm. Here he comes. Here we go. So, I, and I want to point out, it might look like he's actually inside the egg right now, but we have to remember that what we're looking at is not a circle, but a sphere. So just because he's kind of swimming above or below, he's not actually inside. What he'll do is that little Lego on his nose will lock in to the opposite side of the Lego on the egg surface. And once that locks in, that starts a whole host of chemical reactions, uh, which allow the whole process of their genetic information to combine. Uh, and it also allows that bubble to form, which prevents any of the other sperm from actually entering the, the egg. So, you know, if you snooze, you lose. Well, fingers crossed. We're, this is a very perfect egg, so the likelihood of fertilization is very good. Um, so we're just waiting patiently for that sperm to get in through that layer. It's very thick, um, but once it does, it locks out all the other sperm. I think he's just dawdling because he's by himself, and if he had some competition, he'd probably get on that. Yeah. You yeah. know, try to lock it down. That's kind of how they, they go yeah. a little bit. Uh, so it's interesting. Um, oh, yeah, it's happening. They're, they're, oh, yeah. they're hot for it. Uh, I mean, she's a beautiful egg, right? She is a so beautiful uh, in egg. nature, symmetry, you know, we were talking about radial, bilateral symmetry. Symmetry of any kind in nature is really important. Uh, and it's, it, it's an indicator of health. So when we're looking at our egg sample, we're kind of looking to see, are they symmetrical, are they round? And that will tell us how healthy they are. Uh, there are, Carly just put a little drop real quick on there. Uh, in a milliliter oh, of urchin Caitlin. sperm. Whoop, Caitlin. It, oh, it's, it's happening. happening. Yay. Yay. <laughs> you guys, I feel so close to you all. I we know. made a baby. Caitlin and I made a baby. It's wonderful. I'm glad you could be here for this. <laughs> All right, yay! It worked. <laughs> it works every time, I swear. All right.
great. Um, and now we may have to have a Julia Child moment. Yes, we're going to have a, ourselves a little cooking show moment um, because you guys are, are very patient and lovely people, and I don't really feel like you want to sit here for the next hour and a half uh, and wait for more stuff to happen. That's right. And as Caitlin was saying, it takes about 90 minutes for cell division to begin. Um, and the next slide you're going to be seeing, oh, yeah, lots of sperm. I fertilized this one earlier, and it's not quite ready. Let's see. Oh, Can we find oh, any? Oh, 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 all right. <laughs> so this, this slide was fertilized at 4.30 p this afternoon. And you can see it's divided already several times. So after 90 minutes, it just keeps going. Caitlin's going to find some good ones. And you can see it's kind of lopsided. They're all sort of dividing in every direction because the egg is 3D. We're not, it's not completely flat, obviously. But you can see a little bit um, of the cleavage that's happening. Not ours, theirs. <laughs> Which is what you call it when the, uh, when the egg starts to divide and it has those nice little separations between them. That's, that's right. How, that's how we know that, that's that right. stuff is and going. And now Caitlin's going to pull up our day-old egg. And at this point, the eggs are called blastulas. And they are a hollow ball of cells covered with cilia. So they swim around in circles. So here we go, and we're going to see them swimming. Woo! -hoo! <laughs> so they move around. This part might be a little challenging to catch up with them. Well, that one's a good one because oh, he's kind of yeah, See that one on the left? You can see cilia are tiny hair-like structures that make it so the blastula can swim and move around. But at this point, it's still living off its yolk. So, woo, and they kind of tumble through the water. Tumble, tumble, tumble. I think they're really cute. I do, too. I named that one Tom. <laughs> we're very prolific, Caitlin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we got it going on. All right, now the next stage we're going to be looking at is called the gastrula stage. And it is about 48 hours old. The sea urchin now has a gut and can spin around a little faster. It's still living off of its yolk at this point. Now after this stage, we'll, oh, you, can see, you can see that cylindrical part in the middle of the egg. Um, that's the gut. And that, will what, that is what will eventually form the um, orifice where it poops and eats. And there it goes. And it takes about five days to be able to eat on its own. So it's living off its yolk for that long. And at that stage, it's called a pluteus larvae, and it looks totally different from how it looks now. It looks like a little spaceship. Uh, we don't have any of those because yeah, they're a little bit stuck. harder to there raise up. But yeah, there we go. <laughs> Stay. Yeah, they're hard to catch. Teenagers, you know, I like know. they're always out the door. I know. Now, it takes about seven weeks for them to start looking like a tiny sea urchin. And at that point, they become sessile organisms. They pick a spot on the bottom of the ocean, and that's where they stay forever. And it takes it two to five years for the sea urchins to begin to reproduce just like the urchins did for us today. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys so Thank much. Thank you for coming to our sex show. You were rad. And uh, any other questions, please come up. We'll be here for a few more minutes.